gives me great pleasure to read the citation for Sir Malcolm Rifkin. Sir Malcolm Rifkin, KCMG QC, is an established British politician who has served in various roles as a member of parliament and cabinet minister under Prime Ministers Margaret Thatcher, John Major, including Secretary of State for Scotland, Defence Secretary, and Foreign Secretary. Sir Malcolm was also appointed Chairman of the Intelligence and Security Committee by David Cameron in 2010, and 2014 was chosen as Chairman of the World Economic Forum's Nuclear Security Council. In January 2015, he was selected by the OSCE as a member of their Eminent Persons Panel on European Security. Sir Malcolm is also very active in a number of voluntary organizations, including the Dulverton Trust, Combat Stress, and Raleigh International. Sir Malcolm. Sir Malcolm Rifkin, in accordance with the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Richmond, the American International University in London, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of International Relations honoris causa. You have lots of honors to justify honoris causa. You're a fantastic Foreign Secretary and you're a wonderful Member of Parliament for Kensington and Chelsea. <laughs> All the rights and privilege there too. Witness, therefore, we invest you with this hood <clears throat> and present you with a diploma. Congratulations. Chancellor, uh, President, thank you very much indeed for the great honor you have conferred upon me uh, this uh, morning. I must say, President, as you read out the uh, citation, uh, it was a very flattering citation. I was, couldn't help but be reminded of President Lyndon Johnson, who on a similar occasion said, thank you very much. That was the sort of introduction which my father would have enjoyed and my mother would have believed. <laughs> I'm conscious we have a long uh, ceremony and there are many uh, graduates waiting to be uh, conferred their degrees. Uh, so. Uh, I think I will follow the wise precedent of King Henry VIII of England, who apparently said to each of his six wives, please do not worry, I do not intend to keep you long. <laughs> you, you have been kind enough to confer on me a doctorate of international relations and indeed most of my public career has been with regard to foreign policy, international relations, and I had the privilege of serving uh, as uh, the Foreign Secretary and Defense Secretary before then. Uh, you know, there is, of course, often criticism of diplomats, of foreign ministers, as being unprincipled, as being uh, unwilling to recognize the fundamentals of any international dispute. Uh, but you have to bear in mind that the only alternative to diplomatic solutions uh, to the problems of the world are military solutions. Uh, someone once remarked, if you put down the pen, then you will have to take up the sword. So I want to just mention to you that those of you who may have been involved in studying international relations and the whole audience who, whether they like it or not, are involved with the consequences of international relations. We live in difficult times, and I think one of the great uh, tributes I would make to Richmond University is it has, as a liberal arts university, uh, sought to advance the cause of tolerance, of pluralism, uh, and human rights, and of the values that we hold dearly. Uh, I'm rather pleased today to be a former foreign minister. Uh, when you are a minister, you, of course, are constrained by all the normal obligations of the government of which you are part. Harold McMillan, one of our former foreign secretaries, uh, once, as well as prime minister, uh, once said, foreign ministers are always in a cruel dilemma. Their speeches hover between the cliche and the indiscretion. They are either dull or dangerous. Uh, sometimes they're both. Uh, when you've retired, you have a greater freedom. It is said in Britain that ministers know when they are retired. It's when you climb into the back of your car and it doesn't go anywhere. I promised I wouldn't speak for long, and I just want to conclude by making a very genuine, heartfelt tribute 
to you, Chancellor, for the inspiration that you have given to this university. You are the founder of the university, and it would not be, none of us would be here today uh, but for your vision and for your idealism and for the practical way in which you gave substance to that. And I also... And I also want to actually <laughs> say what I believe was an inspired choice in the motto you have given to your university, unity in diversity. And I conclude by referring to that phrase because I think there are three reasons why we should all be proud of it. I think, first of all, as a university itself here in London, the university has been a shining beacon of diversity, students coming from dozens of countries around the world, but all sharing common values, common aspirations, and common achievements. So that is one solid example of unity and diversity. But you've also situated this university here in London. And London itself is an extraordinary city uh, in the world. It is perhaps one of the finest examples of unity and diversity. Millions of people from different backgrounds living overwhelmingly in friendship and in tolerance with each other. We have just uh, elected our first uh, Muslim mayor of the city of London, something that people would have thought was inconceivable only 10, 15 years ago. So London itself is a shining example of unity in diversity. And I think finally, when we look around the problems of the world, and there are serious problems. Someone once said after the end of the Cold War that it was the end of history. That was a very foolish uh, prediction. I prefer the alternative view, that as one door closes, another slams in your face. New problems come forward, as we know with international terrorism, uh, with all these, the ghastly civil war in Syria, uh, with the problems of migration, with all these issues. However we address these, uh, it will be for the generation who are graduating today, in not too many years from now, to take charge of some of these issues, because either these issues or similar issues uh, will be before us. And I simply encourage you, and I'm sure I don't need to encourage you, when you are looking for solutions, not just if you are politicians or in public affairs, but if you're in business, if you're in culture, if you're in the voluntary sector, always to put at the very height of your priorities the values of this university, unity in diversity to respect different cultures, to respect different uh, backgrounds, sometimes different aspirations, but to recognize we all share a common humanity. And it's only by unity and diversity uh, that the world will be slowly but surely a better place for all of us and for generations to come. Thank you very much indeed.